It's great to welcome back to the program today Yanis Varoufakis, an economist and former finance minister of Greece. He is also author of the new book Techno Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism. Uh, Yanis, it's so great to have you back on. And, and this is sort of a continuation of the conversation about capitalism we had last time you were on. Maybe just to introduce this idea to the audience, what defines the transition from capitalism to techno feudalism in your mind? Well, David, thank you. It's great to be back. Uh, look, my, my this is a very, very weird hypothesis of mine. It's uh, very controversial. Uh, it, it 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 all depends on, of course, on what do you mean by capitalism? Okay, but to answer your question directly, what I think has happened over the last eight, nine, ten years is that capital has become so triumphant that um, it dominated <laughs> so powerfully that it actually mutated like a toxic virus that mutates and becomes far more toxic. Uh, and it mutated into what I call cloud capital, the kind of capital that lives inside your smartphone, uh, on your laptop, on the internet, in the cloud, that's thus cloud capital. And this ca capital became so toxic that it killed its host capitalism and replaced it with something that I call techno feudalism. Let me be very specific by, by what I mean. This is not airy fairy stuff. I hope it's not. Uh, the idea here is this. Look, capitalism is predicated on two major islands, if you want, um, you know, so, so, sort of foundations. One is markets. You know, unlike previous societies, everything that matters economically under capitalism was channeled through markets, labor markets, real estate markets, capital markets. And then the second pylon, the second foundation is profit. Uh, capitalism was fueled, the machine, the engine of capitalism was fueled by profit. Unlike previous societies, feudalism, which was founded on land and on rent, capitalism is founded on markets and on profit. My view is that cloud capital has replaced both markets and profit. It has replaced markets with digital fiefdoms, I call them, or platforms, you may call them, like Amazon.com, which is looks like a market, but it don't make any mistake here. It is not a market. Uh, and profit has been replaced by rent, a form of rent. It's not ground rent. It's not like the rent that feudal lords used to collect from the peasants and uh, from the vassals. Uh, but it's cloud rent. It's the, you know, every time you buy something on, of Amazon.com, you pay, or Alibaba, or that doesn't matter what it is, Uber, uh, you pay a substantial amount of whatever it is that uh, um, you pay the, the the actual provider of the good or the service to Jeff Bezos or to the owner of cloud capital. And that is no longer capitalism. So you're talking about the role, if I understand correctly, not just of the tech giants, but the fact that with a lot of these, sure, there are stakeholders and employees and shareholders, but there is a specific person, whether it's Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, that are almost like, in some sense, the, the medieval lords and kings. Is that the analogy to some degree? Yes, I call them cloud lists, or you can call them techno feudal lords if you want. You know, they are the own, owners of cloud capital. They are the ones who, because they own uh, vast quantities of this cloud capital, they have a capacity to make us do a number of things that capitalists of, of yesteryear couldn't do. Their cloud capital can arrest our attention, input into our hearts and minds desires that we didn't think we had or had, right? I mean, advertisers used to do this, but now it's capital that does it. Machines, algorithms that do it, not Don Draper from, you know, Mad Men. The third thing that they do is once they've created these desires in our mind and in our hearts, they actually satiate them. They sell us the stuff by bypassing every market. So the same machine that makes you want a particular pair of binoculars sells it to you outside the market. In addition, as if that were not enough, every time you're on your phone and you're posting a video or liking something or tweeting or whatever, you're adding to that cloud capital. You are actually producing capital for these people uh, for free. That was never the case. You know, Henry Ford 
was a monopoly capitalist, extremely powerful man, not a very nice man, but he never, never, nevertheless, he never had the capacity to make members of the public out there produce capital for him. The only people who would produce capital were the workers who worked in the factories creating the machines that he would then employ to build the Model T. But, you know, um, Zuckerberg, every time you post something on Facebook or on Instagram, you are, <laughs> without being paid, creating and producing his cloud capital. That is unique. That has never happened before. This is why I think we need a new word, and capitalism um, is no longer a good descriptor of the system we live in. It's not even the tier capitalism. It's not even surveillance capitalism. It's simply not capitalism. That's why I, I came up with this very ugly world, word, techno-feudalism. But it I'm is an curious, ugly system, so um, maybe in world. I'm curious your thoughts on the way in which artificial intelligence may become a layer on top of this analysis. I've been reading all sorts of different opinions about the way in which some of these new AI tools may manifest, and it seems to be directly related to some of what you're talking about. On the one hand, there are those who believe that AI will be in some sense an equalizing force against some of what you describe. It sounds like Keynes all over again. We're going to have so much leisure time because AI is going to give us so much more productivity. It's all going to be great. We will get so much more done. On the other hand, more realistically, in my opinion, there are opinions that for certain sorts of workers, the AI revolution may be a very useful and good thing, but that for a lot of the uh, employed population, it won't be so good and it will only reinforce a lot of what you talk about in the book and the inequality that already exists. My guess is that you lean more on the latter rather than the former. I, I would be shocked if your view that you're going to tell me now is you think AI will be a great equalizing force. But I'm curious how you see that in the context of your analysis. I think we're probably on the same page by what you just said. Uh, let, let me let me make three points, however. First, AI is not something that will happen to us. It's already happened to us. You know, what I refer to as cloud capital is already AI-driven. Yes. So machine learning, reinforcement learning, that's all AI. Uh, people talk a lot about AI have been since, you know, uh, chat GPT-4 has come out because, uh, it, 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 you know, you and I have indirect... Uh, experience of it by playing around with GPT-4. But AI has been around for yonks. It's not a new thing. And the um, the capacity of the algorithms of Google, of Facebook, of uh, Amazon, and so on, Uber, Airbnb, Spotify, um, has been around for a very long time. And this is why we have techno-feudalism already. It's not something we will have. What AI will do is it will reinforce it. It will you know, m turbocharge it. So um, if you think of, take Alexa, Amazon's Alexa. It's a machine sitting on your desk, your kitchen, wherever you have it, if you have it, uh, and you're training, training it, you are training it to train you, to train it, to train you, to train it, uh, to know you so well that it gives you good advice and then helpful advice. And then at some point it can actually say, you know, maybe you want to buy that. And then you buy it just because you've trusted the machine because it has given you such great advice. That has been happening now for years. It's not new. Imagine when it starts, you know, with, with G GPT-5 coming out, when you can actually talk to GPT and, you know, an AI bot uh, turbocharges the capacity of Alexa to discuss things with you, uh, to discuss things with you. And then its power to generate desires into your mind that are functional to the interests of Jeff Bezos, you know, goes to the power of, of N. Uh, so, but that is already happening, it's just that it's going to be turbocharged. That's point number one. Point number two is that, look, like with every technology, every technology that's ever been devised by human beings has had its positive and its negative effects. Yes. Uh, it has um, liberated and it has enslaved us. Uh, <laughs> so that, that is nothing new, new there. Right? Uh, they take the automobile, you know, it destroyed many jobs and then it created many. Now, the fear is that with, with GPT-5, 
the number of jobs that will be created will be many, many more than the ones that will be created. Uh, but that's something to be established. Uh, I think it's probably true. But in any case, you see, if my book is not about what AI will do to us. It is what it, what it has already done to us. Right. <laughs> and that's something that I believe that it needs to be emphasized because, you see, I love AI personally. You know, I'm a techno enthusiast. The idea that there is a, that there is a program, a computer program out there, which can actually design antibiotics that save human lives. That's remarkable. That should be celebrated. This is an achievement of the human spirit. But at the same time, AI is, is enslaving us because it's actually inputting desires into our heads that we neither should have or had would have had otherwise or needed. Um, it drives proletarian labor in Amazon warehouses in the fact on factory floors amongst delivery people. Uh, it effectively kills their soul and often their bodies. Uh, and and fundamentally, and very profoundly, by shifting a lot of value produced from workers and even from capitalists to the bank accounts of the Jeff Bezos. Think of all these, all these billions and trillions. They're being siphoned off the circular flow of income. That causes a general drop in aggregate demand around our macroeconomies in the United yes. States, in the, in the European Union, in Japan, and so on. And that means that investment falls because people don't have enough money, capitalists do not invest, and we are falling behind, not only in terms of economic activity, but also in our capacity to invest in the green technology which are necessary to save the planet from a climate catastrophe. And then you have the central banks, which, which are then forced to print more money in order to replenish the, the losses of aggregate demand. But that is at a, at a time when you have inflation and they are, you know, they are damned if they print, they are damned if they don't print, and they are caught up in a conundrum that they are. So, cap, you know, the, the system we live in, which used to be, in my view, capitalism, which was always an unstable system to produce in crisis, the crisis that techno feudalism is producing are much deeper and much worse and much more catastrophic. We're going to go to a break on the podcast with Yanis Varoufakis, but the conversation will continue and we'll post the entire discussion to, to YouTube. So I'm curious in terms of actionable steps you propose to combat the negative impacts of this framework that you describe. And speaking very broadly, you can find opinions specifically about the AI development must be stopped or proposals about universal basic income. What about if you own your data and you can sell it to Facebook or whoever as a way to monetize that free output, as you say, that you are producing for Mark Zuckerberg or whoever? But the counterpoint is it's probably worth 10 bucks. That's not really a solution, right? What 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 are the areas of focus that you are looking at in terms of of resolving what you are identifying here? Well, one thing is for certain, I'm not proposing uh, that we uninvent uh, software algorithms and AI. <laughs> As I said before, if you, if you can save one person through AI from uh, a bacterium that uh, uh, would not be killed otherwise by antibiotics, then AI is worth it. And right. we should, you know, we should never, never, never Never try to erase our technological advances. Uh, we cannot, we shouldn't do it, and we can't do it anyway. <laughs> um, knowledge wants to go further, not backwards. Uh, what concerns me is not even, you know, the the surveillance capitalism aspect of it. In what people, what these algorithms know about me. Uh, I can understand that people don't want those algorithms to know everything about them. I can understand that, but that's not what really concerns me. What concerns me is what these people own. Not what they know, but what they own. And they own really very powerful, toxically powerful algorithms, which should be um, owned uh, collectively. Uh, they should be like public utilities that, that we all use together and which we do democratically decide how they're going to be used. So let me give you a, a simple example, David, of how I would like take Uber or Lyft. At the moment, it's a very toxic enterprise. It's, it, it's misanthropic. It really exploits workers, uh, it creates awful conditions for drivers, and it exploits society generally. Uh, 
But imagine a situation where I just, uh, you alluded to that by saying we, that we should own our data. How about owning our identity, our digital identity, which, as you know, we do not own in the, on the internet today. Today, if you want to prove who you are, you have to, 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 to get Google to, you know, you have to beg Google or your bank for that matter, the, you know, Bank of America or Citibank to uh, attest who you are. <laughs> so you have to, you have to, 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 to beg some kind of conglomerate to testify to who you are. Uh, for that reason, if you want to call a taxi, you're out on the street and you want to call a cab, either through Uber or Lyft, you know, Uber knows who you are because it's got your credit card or debit card uh, details in there. And then you are confined, you are encased in this digital fiefdom called Uber. But imagine if you owned your identity and you could prove to anybody on the internet who you are. And you would say, I'm on the corner of 20th Street and Exeter, and I'm going to the airport. Who wants to who wants to take me there? Just like not, not on any app, but out there. And suddenly you have very various bids. It could be from, from local collectives of drivers, it could be even from the public uh, transport authority who says, you know, you idiot, there is a you know a, a bus that stops next to you take it it will be quicker or you know a, um, a subway or whatever yeah. or you know whoever whoever they can offer you a ride okay now that is my vision of how you you can have ai you can have software you can have apps you have the internet you have the free market and at the same time without the uh, the, the, the concentration of power of those techno feudal lords. So uh, it's it's to that, some degree taking away the power of the platform, if I understand correctly. Yes, destroying the power of the platform, not taking, mm. destroying it, wrecking it. Uh, but for that, you need new legislation that, for instance, uh, gives you the right to your own ident digital identity, to your own data. Yeah? Uh, we need a bill of digital rights. Uh, we also need uh, the we need to change corporate law in two important ways. Uh, for instance, you and I and all our audience, we are, as I said before, we are producing capital for these cloud lists. We are producing it with everything that we do on their sites. Well, we are producing capital, but we are not getting any dividends for that capital. Right. <laughs> it's only the shareholders that get it. The moment we realize that in this technological universe, we are all contributing to the capital of the large firms. How about saying that, you know, if you, to Google or to, you know, Airbnb, if you want to function in, 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 in the United States of America or in the European Union, you're going to have to take 10% of your shares and deposit them in a social equity fund with the dividends accumulating so that they can then be distributed around as the basic income to everyone because to, to, and to be clear on this detail Giannis, but to everyone you are hogging to, to everyone or dividend. to the users of the platform who are contributing the capital to everyone, everyone. because it okay. is impossible to know who has contributed who hasn't contributed you know you talk to somebody on the street that somebody says oh you know david has said this to me they put it in instagram suddenly you have contributed indirectly to the instagram cloud cap mm. um let's not forget that you know if you phone your iphone every technology in it was created by some research project uh that was paid for by the state by the american state the australian state the german state uh and so you know we all have contributed to this capital and we're getting no dividends for it. So, to, you know, to, in, we don't want to create a huge bureaucracy that determines who gets what dividends. So give it to everyone. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's an Occam's razor solution. Everybody gets the same. Since we can never really work out who has contributed what to this, to, to this cloud cap. Uh, and then uh, finally, you know, I think that with the merging of finance and big tech, into fintech, uh, we have a remarkable new opportunity to do away with uh, the current uh, vagaries of the banking system. Mm. Because think about it, it's preposterous. You know, if, if an extraterrestrial arrived on Earth, in, you know, New York or Los Angeles, and watched you guys uh, make payments, they, they would think that you're mad. 
because the, 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 the citizens of the United States of America have given very few bankers exclusive monopoly rights over the payments. So if you want to buy a coffee from Starbucks, you have to have an account with a bank. Why? Why do you need to have an account with a bank? If you want to have an account with a bank, I'm a liberal person, have an account with a bank. But why do I need to have an account with a bank to buy a bloody cup of coffee? Imagine if the Fed were to give every citizen or resident for the matter of the United States, similarly here in the European Union with the European Central Bank, um, a free digital wallet with a PIN number. So you can have all your monies, your receipts from your advertisers, if you have a podcast or your salary, if you're working for a company, you know, goes into that central bank digital wallet for free. And this is, you know, a public utility offered to citizens or residents for free. And then you can make any payments you want from there. Then suddenly, why do you need to have a bank account? You don't. I mean, you may want to have a bank account if you want, uh, um, you know, to, to, to borrow money from a bank, from someone. Uh, money that you don't have and you want to borrow it. And then suddenly banks have to offer you good terms, low interest rates for you to, to, to care for, for that. Right. Um, but suddenly, suddenly, think about it. No bank is too big to fail. Because if every resident of the United States has a digital wallet provided by the Fed, which means you're perfect safe, perfectly safe, as safe as the United States is. Right? And you can put your money in there. And you will receive the interest rate of the of the that the Fed gives. At the moment, is what? 3.5%. Not bad. Better than what Bank of America gives you. Right? <laughs> and you can make any payments. And you don't have to worry about bank grants. You don't have to worry about banks doing stupid things and failing. Suddenly, no bank is big, too big to fail. So you integrate you know, the, 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 the digital technologies with a public payments system. The central bank of the United States becomes the banker of everyone. Okay? And you can even save, uh, you can even, even ensure that there is privacy because you can separate the functioning of that ledger by the Fed. Uh, it can be done on the basis of uh, pseudonyms, like Bitcoin has, a, you can, you are a number, like, you know, when you have a Bitcoin uh, uh, wallet, you have a number. So yes. the Fed doesn't know who you are. And even if he looks at your transactions, doesn't know who is having those transactions. And then you can have another body that can find out who you are if needs be, if you know there is a violation of some criminal code, whatever. Um, everything we've just discussed now, even, even if it doesn't sound that radical, it would really change the complexion of our societies. Giannis, last thing I want to ask you about before we go, it's sort of unrelated, but it's something I like asking economists to understand their worldview. We often hear statistics like the richest one percent have 40 percent of the wealth or the richest one percent have 60 percent of the wealth. And it's a level of inequality that is both bad for the economy and morally wrong, et cetera. If you were to sum up all of your economic beliefs, and apply it to that question in your ideal world, based on everything you know about economics, but also psychology and incentives and business, the richest one percent would have what percent of the wealth? Well, the, the richest one percent in my in my book should have one percent of the wealth. <laughs> Perfect parity. <laughs> because. It, in a good society, in a good society, in a good society, and you know, and whatever fluctuation there might be between people, um, I don't mind people being that, you know, David. I really, I, I, I do not suffer from envy. Um, if you know, if, if I know that Jeff Bezos is a very smart businessman, right? I'm quite happy for him to, 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 to own a lot more than I do, a lot more. Um, because I'm a hopeless businessman, I give everything away whatever I have or value I give away. Uh, so I'm quite happy to see Jeff Bezos having a lot of money. You know what I'm not happy with? I'm not happy with Jeff Bezos getting rich in his sleep without doing anything. Mm. His money, more money, simply because he's got it. Because this is what happens. This is what happens. I'm not happy when, you, you know, when people accumulate rent. So for instance, um, this, the standard example that I give my students I've been giving my student for years is, you know, take a little restaurant or a, a, a restaurant owner struggling very hard to build up a clientele and to make some money providing good food for the community, right? Uh, he has a lot of competition because there are other restaurants and he suffers, you know, or she 
every day, every day, waking up at four in the morning, working all day. The owner of the building has no problem with this person going bankrupt because he will vacate the premises and replace him with somebody else. Mm. This guy gets richer the more competition there is and more of those restaurant owners go to the wall because whatever he does as the owner of the building, his rents go up and up and up without contributing anything. Now, that is a problem. The problem is when you have the power to extract other people's product. Yeah, I guess to make a short counterpoint to that, I don't know that it's exactly like that in this in this sense. While it is true that more competition in the restaurant industry means more potential tenants for the owner of the building, there are significant costs to turnover. People who are going out of business rarely take care of the building the way someone who's doing well is doing. Uh, and if everybody's going out of business with their restaurants over time, I don't know that the amount of rent that can be charged will go up. In fact, it may be dragged down because restaurant owners aren't making as much so they can't pay as much for rent. In a, I, I think the, the example is interesting and it's very good in, in many ways. But I do think that the owner of the building does have an interest in the restaurant owners doing reasonably well, do they not? Of course, of course, the more the better, the better off the restaurant owner is, the greater the rent they, they get charged. There's no doubt about that. But what is the rationale for creaming off whatever profits the restaurant owner makes to give to somebody who doesn't do anything? And oh, OK. Case, yes. No, that's a th yes. And to go back to the point of your example, that's absolutely and, true. And in, in any case, you know, uh, if you go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York uh, or to, you know, to, for that matter, to the Statue of Liberty, it's very well maintained and it's not privately owned. Right. So we don't need to have private ownership in order to have good maintenance. Absolutely not. That's absolutely the case. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. We've been speaking with Yanis Varoufakis. The new book is Techno Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism. We've spoken about many more things uh, than just that. Always great having you on. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, David.